you know, heroes in our home are writers and authors. Uh-huh. And we, I, you know, I feel like we learn so much through stories and books. Wow. And, and, you know, I think you said it so beautifully. I think it was on um, in one of your interviews, maybe it was with Seth Meyers or something, what you were talking about windows and mirrors and mm-hmm. how important that is. And I feel like with us in our home, that's so important to be able to learn so much about people and cultures and food and life wow. and like you know I mean you know you're you're <laughs> it's so true no I feel like it, it's my go-to and um you know just how even the, the windows like I feel like I, I when I was younger I thought about the windows you know for other people right like um and and then um and the mirrors for myself me looking for books where I was represented and I and I feel like I've learned so much through the windows of the books that about myself and about the world and about cultures that I would never have known anything about. I mean, when I was writing another Brooklyn and when I was talking about the different rituals people have for death and dying and and how narrow our own mourning experience is here wow. in the US and how little time we're given for that mourning experience, right? Whereas other cultures, they, they know how to do this. They know how to, you know, stay connected to the ancestors that you know how to respect the dead and respect that loss and I was like wow I never thought about it right I just thought that this is how it is and this is what you do and you you grieve for a certain while and you get over with you get over it because people stop having patience right. for it right so it's it's interesting it's 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 been a journey reading has been such a journey for me that is so cool um this leads into my first question for you which mm-hmm. most people would really feel an accomplishment, a sense of accomplishment from just one book. So, I mean, let alone dozens. And I just want to know, how do you do it? And (laughs) the typical day, like, day for you. It's so interesting. I mean, I'm so honored to be here. I love your book club. I, you know, I love the work you're doing. I love, you know, the fact that you're such a reader. It, it, it's, it's all exciting for me. So I'm so glad to be talking to you, Jen. And, um, you know, I've wanted to be a writer since I was seven years old and I I didn't have a path, right? I didn't know any writers. It wasn't like now where you could actually have a conversation with a writer. There weren't websites, (laughs) you know, there was nothing. I just had the, sometimes the hardcover, but most often paperback books that maybe there was a little author bio, but I had no sense of the process, but I knew I loved telling stories. And so once I started publishing, I didn't think, um, I didn't see myself as writing one kind of book, right? I didn't see myself as writing just novels. I knew I wanted to write poetry. I knew I wanted to write fiction. I didn't even know that a category of young people's literature really existed. I knew those books were out there because I saw the Newberry stickers and stuff. But but I knew when I knew that existed, I knew I wanted to write that. <laughs> like so so um, I just loved it. And and basically, it's hard to turn my my brain off right so so there's always some idea up in there and it's not so I'm usually writing a young adult book maybe a picture book an adult book maybe I'm working on a newspaper article and and when I get bored with one I go to the other and I when I get bored with that I go to the next and and you know 32 books later this is where I am but but it's changed um too with motherhood right um I remember, I don't know how it was for you, but I remember when I was pregnant with my daughter, um, I was trying to write really fast because I knew when she got here, I wouldn't have time to write. And then she was two weeks late. And so that gave me an extra two weeks to finish behind you, I think. And then um, and then there was that period where they don't move so- so much so you can write. Yeah. Right? You, know, you know, you can just put them to your boob and keep on working. Yeah. Yeah, and then they roll over, but she started walking at nine months. And I remember my partner was um, doing her medical residency. And here I am, you know, at home, you know, mothering and trying to um, still do my work. And, and, and I'm like, wait, no, you're supposed to walk in like 14. I was supposed to have another couple of months of like being able to like sit. So, and then it was kind of, um, but it really shifted. So I realized that I had to kind of make, um, I had to build boundaries around my writing. I remember a writer talking about the closed door, right? Like her mother said, when that door is closed, um, mommy is working and as a mom that's so hard to do right you hear your kids knocking so so it's it's definitely been a journey to figuring out how to continue to do it I can only imagine 
so red at the bone first it left it was honestly probably one of my favorite books I've ever read in my life and it's Thank just you. so beautiful um the way that you're able to talk about so many different topics and subjects and the one big one is obviously family and how family sticks together and circling and moving together apart but always coming back together in a way it almost reminds me of a murmuration and the way that it twists and turns. Mm. And it, it seems to be uh, that family is a common theme in your writing. Can you mm -hmm. share a little bit about what inspired you to write this novel? Um, I, what, I really wanted to talk about motherhood um, and the complexity of it. And what does it mean to choose motherhood at 15, 16, when you know, you know, when we as adults looking at Iris, we know she's going to change your mind. She's 15, <laughs> right? And we think of all the many times we've changed our minds since we were 15, 16. And so I really wanted to examine that because um, I always think of the teen pregnancy as the tragedy novel, right? And what if it wasn't that? What if it wasn't tragic? Um, I also really wanted to look at the Tulsa race massacre because I didn't find out about it until I was in my 20s. And it was such an um, important part of what happened to black wealth. And so, you know, especially over the last four years, hearing people blame underserved people for their circumstances, especially underserved people of color, and not look at the history of this country post reconstruction and lynching and Jim Crow and all of these ways and, and you know, Rosewood and Tulsa and, um, you know, every place where black wealth was destroyed in some way. And I really wanted to think, talk about the people who came after that and what their struggles were and, and who they were to bring that moment into present day. And, um, so, so those were two of the themes. And then, of course, once I had that idea of thinking about what it means to be a teenage mom, what does it mean to be a teenage dad? And so then the character of Aubrey, who's one of my favorite characters in the book, um, came about. And in thinking about him, I thought about, again, you know, there's the stereotype of the Black father who leaves, right? And, and, and what if that is not... What if we tell that story um, and we tell the truth about it? We tell the story of the Black fathers who stay, the many, many, many Black fathers who stay and what they look like um, and what their stories are. So it's um, it was such an interesting process in Red at the Bone because it's not a linear narrative um, because of the overlap and the way it goes back and forth. And it starts in the middle of the book. Um, I'm sorry, it starts in the middle of the story, right? But that afternoon there was an orchestra playing is the first line and it's showing you as the reader, you're not coming in at the beginning. You're coming in in the middle of a narrative. And in that middle of the narrative that starts way back Tulsa and before to this point, and that continues with Melody going off, you know, it's, it's, it's talking about that long line of, um, history, present, and future. Um, so it was really fun to just kind of investigate all those different places and to go back and research um, the Tulsa Race Massacre and also to really think about family. At that time, at, when I was writing it, um, my daughter was, I think, 15, 16. And, um, but, but having written out so much for young people, especially young adults, I, as a writer, um, Madeline Lingle said, when you write, write remembering the child you were because the essence of childhood doesn't change and I think about that when I write I go back to being 10 I go back to being 15 I go back to being eight um, and really try to mine those memories so when I was writing Melody it was easy for me to access my teenage self um, and Iris as a teenager but it was also easy to look at my daughter and say yeah that's teenagerhood too right it looks like that and it looks like this so I was just wondering how how do you avoid those stereotypes? And was that a conscious decision or conscious choice? Yeah, it is a very conscious decision. And, um, you know, I think of stereotypes like cliches. And I think a careful writer is really trying to not put cliches in their book. And, and the same, it's easy to do a stereotype, right? It's easy to have some 
um, idea of what the world thinks all people are, uh, what this country thinks all people are in a narrative. Then, and then just, oh, it's like, oh, the audience will get that because they know this thing. And I found as a writer that the more specific you are, the more universal the writing is. And so to be deeply specific allows for the avoidance of stereotypes and also being very conscious of stereotypes, right? I know there's a stereotype of the black teenage pregnant girl, you know, and I know that's a stereotype, that's not the truth. Um, and I, not to say that there aren't um, black girls who get pregnant as teenagers, there are also white girls who get pregnant as teenagers and Latinx girls. So, so to really think about it and think about um, going back to that idea of mirrors and windows, when that, I remember this with when I wrote a book called I Hadn't Meant to Tell You This. And um, actually, no, even a better example is Each Kindness, which is a picture book. And when I wrote Each Kindness, which is the story of um, two girls, um, and one is um, <clears throat> a poor girl coming from coming into a new school and the other kids kind of dislike her. And, and when I was writing that character of, um, of Maya, who's the poor girl, I knew, I, I said to myself, what happens when the kid who is like Maya comes to this book? Is she gonna see herself as a victim? And then I didn't wanna do that. So I was very intentional about, at one point in the book, Maya's asking all the kids to play um, <clears throat> jacks with her play a game with her and the kids don't. And she comes back into the classroom and she's like, I bet you can't guess who the new Jack's champion of the world is. And, and, and that was a very intentional moment for me to show the reader, she's not stopping. She's not getting beaten down and going to sit in the corner and not play a game. And she's going to you know, do her thing and come back and say, you know what, I got this. Yeah. And so that that reader can see that. And so I am conscious of, of the messages I'm putting on the page in the character, inside those characters. Um, so, but, but I think if we deny that the stereotypes exist or if we are not conscious of the way we use them ourselves, they're gonna end up in our books. I, I think um, the main thing is my books are character driven, right? So the character is even big, is, it comes to me before plot. Like I always say, you put two people in a room, you have everything, you have, conflict the minute they start talking you have dialogue you have the setting of the room um and eventually as their conflict grows the plot comes um and so i i tend to start with the characters and see where they take me everything i write i read out loud because it has to sound a certain way as well as look a certain way on the page um and that really helps me get deeper into their character i also you know ask lots of questions about what the character wants and how they're going to get it. I mean, it, it's interesting because I just finished the screenplay for Red at the Bone and, and, and shifting from, you know, writing the novel to writing the screenplay. There's still all those questions that you have to ask, but you're asking them in this three act structure and, and things have to happen differently. So, so I, but, but in both cases, you really have to have a deep sense of who your characters are. And so for Iris, um, I was constantly asking, what does she want? And, and it made sense that um, it changed because she grew up, right? She wasn't stagnant in this way. Whereas um, Aubrey was a kid, he's like, you know, here's stability. I've, I've moved all my life and here's stability, here's love, here's something solid, this child, here's, you know, this good home, I'm good. <laughs> like, you know, I've gotten what I wanted. Almost too, you know, when there's a trauma in someone's life and they're sort of stuck in that trauma, there's almost mm -hmm. a sense of that with him too, where he is good, mm -hmm. he is good and he's not wanting to necessarily evolve as Iris is. He wants, he's good mm -hmm. with his love, his stability and stuck mm -hmm. there too. How do you feel about moving <sighs> out? How do you feel that she's doing? And if you could follow up with her future. Oh, uh, you know, I think you know, like Aubrey, she definitely has trauma, right? She has the trauma of her mom leaving and the trauma of her father's um, demise. And she also has the, the foundational structure of those grandparents of Sadie and Poboy and um, her, her good friends. And so I, I, I like to think that she's absolutely fine and fire. I mean, I think the character was fire on the page when I was writing her and I think she's grown into that fire even more so. So um, 
I, I one thing you know you'll see in Harbor Me, it's like that 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 the importance of um, chosen family as as well as the biological family around you. And I feel like Melanie and her her young people have grown up into you know good less young people because they're not <laughs> old yet. Um, so, but yeah, yeah. And I feel like even me writing that scene. I always think of my work as not necessarily physically autobiographical, but I always talk about how it's emotionally autobiographical, right? You really have to go to those places and feel those feelings in order to get them on the page. And, and writing the Aubrey scene, I kept rewriting it. I'm like, no, it's not ending like this. I'm like, like that's not what happens. And, um, and the rewrites sounded stilted. They sounded, un they sounded dishonest. Um, and finally coming back and reading that out loud. And I was boohooing as I, you know, read what I had just written, um, just because, I, I mean, I lived through 9-11. I was pregnant during 9-11. It was traumatic AF, you know, um, but, but I also, because I was pregnant and then because I was a new mom, there was this way that you put this shield up. It's like, no, nope, I can't deal with this right now. I'm gonna compartmentalize until I can. And I do feel like in that moment with Aubrey, because we lost people, um, it was like, I'm, I'm dealing with this now. Like this, this, all these feelings that I've been holding back are right here, right now. And this is what it looks like. So, and then thinking about all those, the young people, because that's how, that's what happened. I mean, you know, people ran out of their school. It was like, my dad is in that building. My mom is in that building. You know, my sister works there and just having to go back there. And I think that's the reason that people don't finish books, right? <laughs> that people aspire to write and then, um, don't finish writing because you really have to go to those hard places to to get at the truth, to get at that honesty in the narrative. I love that you write for adolescents as well. I think it's just like you're so well rounded, and the ch and young children. We have um, books upstairs that I'm reading to my three year old, and I'm having okay. fun with. So I just love that you're able to do that. I I want to know what your secret is <laughs> to writing <laughs> about serious issues for adolescents. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's challenging, I'm sure, for adults. I can't imagine what it's like having to weave that into um, mm -hmm. adult or, you know, young children books or children. Yeah, it's, um, I think the main thing is to keep the hope in the book, right? Um, you have to bring hope. So if you're writing about something that feels challenging, um, it just can't be devastating because you didn't want to feel, I mean, we don't want to feel devastated now, let alone when we were young people and our young people don't want to, but they want to, they don't, they also don't want to be lied to. Right. Right. So, cause they see right through us. They're so much smarter than we are. <laughs> it's, it's bananas. And so, so for me, it's that balance. It's like, how do, how, how do I sh talk to them? and let them know that I see them. I see them as human. I see them as brilliant. I see them as kind. And, and, um, and, that, and show them that, yeah, these things happen and here's the hope. And this is why we get up every morning and this is why we're still here and this is why we survive and we'll keep surviving. I just um, finished this picture book called The Year We Learned to Fly. Um, and it's basically about these two kids. It's the same illustrator who did The Day You Begin because I love him. Uh, um, and about the two, two kids who um, basically um, are cooped up in their house, right, for different reasons. And, and they're, um, they're told the story of the people being able to fly. You know, there's the, um, the story about African-Americans, the Africans being able to fly back across the water when they were enslaved and and that's where their spirits went to and so their grandmother teaches them to close their eyes and basically leave their bodies and 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 um and then they begin to teach other kids how to do it but it is this moment of like yeah we are in this pandemic and we are in our houses and and how do we survive this how do we stay sane how do we grow yeah. up um whole and filled with empathy and love um given that we're at this kind of Point right now, but I, I really do think that not, there is nothing we can't talk about with young people as long as we do it at their level and you know at their intellectual level, at their emotional level. Um, even with Harbor Me, I mean the book um, you and your son are reading now. There's a lot going on in that book, and it's told from the point of view of 
uh, 10 and 11 year olds and this is how they talk and this, this is what they know. And, and they're, you know, they're just so clear eyed young people. And so when you bring that to them, they, they believe you and they, they, they're there with you because they do know you see them. And with the very young kids, when I'm writing picture books, I think of it like poetry, you know? Um, so, or, or like, uh, when, I don't know if you've read the other side, but the other side begins, that summer, the fence that stretched through our town seemed bigger. We lived in a yellow house on one side of it. White people lived on the other. And mama said, don't climb over that fence when you play. She said it wasn't safe. And so that's the first page and, and it's beautiful watercolors, but line by line, the kid is asking, when you say that summer, the fence that stretched through our house seemed bigger. They're like, what house, what summer, what fence? Um, we lived in a yellow house on one side of it. Who's this we? And white people lived on the other. So now you know the people are not white. <clears throat> and mama said, don't climb over the fence when you play. So now they know it's a child like them. She said it wasn't safe. And then what wasn't safe about it? So they turned the page, right? And so, um, and so for me, each line break, the way the words are on the page really matter because I'm thinking of it very visually and what's going, because you're working, as you know, with a very short attention span. And if you lose them, they're gone. They're <laughs> like, I'm out. Like, so, so it is about, and as you, I'm a minimalist in my adult writing and it's, um, I just bring that to my writing for children. Or I brought that to my adult writing because I was writing young people's literature um, a lot more as a, um, before I started writing more adult books. There's so much optimism and um, which is one of the things that I love also in your books is that you you just have so much optimism <laughs> and, and, and you've said that you've just like books that don't offer hope. So mm -hmm. how do you keep that optimistic? And especially during a pandemic and everything that's been going on politically with the election and Black Lives Matter, how do you make sure to keep things optimistic for your reader? Huh. We're still here. I mean, <laughs> that, that, that for me, that every day is, I'm like, you know, especially, you know, as people of color, you know, Black people, we came here to be enslaved, to work until we die, to create more enslaved people who worked until they die, to make this country rich for people who didn't look like us. And we didn't die. You know, so that's that, you know, we went on to become writers and presidents and lawyers and teachers and librarians. And to me, that is amazing. So I think that's what I carry with me every day. And my daughter's always like, you're so conceited, mommy. I'm like, no, we're amazing. Like, this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, so I think that that and 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 I, I definitely have a deep belief in the human spirit and um, and humans in general, like I, I think at the heart of it, even the like I my partner's always making fun of me because when someone's behaving badly, I'm like, they might have a brain injury or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like she's like, you think everyone has some guy? I'm like, you know, are they might have some deep damage in their right. lives? Like, I don't think anyone is born bad yeah. right so, so so i think that helps like understanding not just seeing people as a problem or seeing a person as a problem um but just having this hope that we've survived um we have lots of challenges some of us don't come through those challenges in the best light but a lot of us end up trying to be okay in the world and i think that keeps me so optimistic i i do think that people are inherently good um, so even, even when we're talking about stuff like racism, I don't, I think it's, it, you know, fear. Like, I think that fear is heartbreaking to me. It's like, why are we in a country that's raising this kind of fear and how, and how do we fight against it? Um, but not to say, oh, that person's racist, they're bad. Like, it's so much more complicated right. to, than that to me. Um, so, so that kind of, the work keeps me optimistic. Um, <laughs> And, and the, the work that has been done keeps me optimistic. No, I, I, I got tattoos when I was 22. I was in New York. I was drunk with one of my best friend's sisters, got tattoos on my wrist, and I got them I got them removed after I had my baby, my first baby, because I'm oh, wow. my baby. And I'm like, no self-respecting mother would ever have tattoos. Wow. And so two weeks ago, I don't know what, I mean, maybe it's part of your book. Maybe it's where I'm at in my life, but I kind of went F you world 
Mm -hmm. I am Jen, no matter what. And that was part of who I am. So I actually just put him back on. Funny. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is what a mom looks like. <laughs> what are your tattoos? I know I have so many tattoos. They're all covered up in turtlenecks. <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm, I can't wait to get more. I am, they're just stars. It's nothing like. Oh, wow. Uh, those are beautiful, though. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's fabulous. <laughs> it's that's... Um, mother, it's one of those weird things. I get, yeah. like, let me see. It's so true. I don't know if you can see it. So this is an olive oh, tree because we go to um, um, the south of France all the time. And my partner and I both got it. And we got different roots because my roots are different than her roots. So hers are a little craggly oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> from her childhood and mine are, you know, huge family coming from lots of different places. But I just love it. I, every time I look at it, I am yeah, so happy. I would be too. We just planted olive trees actually in our front yard they're my favorite olives and oaks they're just they're so oh. the i don't know something about the leaves and the roots and the beautiful yeah. oh, that's <laughs> um well speaking of being a badass um you recently received the macarthur grant which is so amazing <laughs> and so cool um what was it like to receive that phone call the the macarthur calls and this is the call you know, I've known people who've gotten the MacArthur. I have not dreamed of getting the MacArthur. I thought, you know, but I'd be MacArthur adjacent my life. And knowing um, uh, MacArthur, uh, a couple of MacArthur people is really nice, right? You know, these geniuses. Yeah. It's August and the phone rings and um, it's a Chicago number. And I'm like, I don't know anyone in Chicago. It's probably spam. I'm not going to answer it. Didn't answer it. Finally, I was coming back. Um, from the grocery store and I just haphazardly picked it up and someone says, you know, hi, this is Cecile. Yeah, I'm calling from the MacArthur committee. And I literally sat down. Like I just, <laughs> I, like my legs went out oh, from God. under me, like completely out from under me. And I was just like, oh shoot. Like, is this that call? And, and I knew it was, right? They wouldn't call to ask me about something else. And so I was just like, Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I, I, I was speechless. And, and, you know, I've gotten some awards in my life and I have never been speechless. <laughs> I have never, never been speechless. And so um, I, I remember even with uh, when Brown Girl Dreaming got the Newberry honor. So this was my fourth Newberry honor. And so they call it with the Newberry committee calling. So the fourth one, by the time they said Newberry honor, I'm like, okay, who got the gold? <laughs> like, I was just shady by that point. Yeah. And then it was like, <laughs> Frank Kwame Alexander. I'm like, okay, the crossover got the goal. I'm good. Um, and so, but literally I sat down and, you know, we chat and, and I cannot believe it also because when another friend had gotten it, they called in July and, um, and they had to keep it secret till um, September. So when, so by August, I figured MacArthur's chosen those, you know, everyone knows who got it. So I was completely taken off guard. <laughs> I was, I was over, um, by our main house and and my partner was here seeing patients remotely and so I ran the I, I you know I put down the phone I ran the 200 yards over here and my son's following behind me and um he's like what I'm, and, and you can't tell any right you can only tell one person so I figured the family unit is my one person <laughs> and so I run and I tell my and my son's behind me and I'm like I got the MacArthur I got the MacArthur and he's like what that I'm like what's that and I'm like it's a huge award he's like it's not like you haven't gotten huge awards oh, before, Mom. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, okay, way to either be a hater yeah. or like to keep me in my place in like, your mom. I got the triple crown right now. <laughs> no. What can, can we expect from you next? What are you working on? What are we? Oh, oh man. So I'm, I'm trying to finish an adult nonfiction. I'm trying to finish a middle grade um, fiction book about a boy named um, Emmett. Um, and, and I just finished the screenplay for Red at the Bone. I'm working on the screenplay to another Brooklyn. I have a, a mini series coming out based on my book, um, Behind You. So that is, uh, I don't, I'm not sure when we're going into the room for that. Um, and, and, um, a couple other projects. That's so amazing. That's so cool. So this one comes from, I think someone named Pony, um, which I like the name. Very cool. Uh, you weave words together like pieces of people's souls going beyond the two-dimensional world of the pages and into a hidden place resting somewhere inside the hearts of your characters. What inspired you to write with such a poetic tone and 
What were some of your writing influences? Oh, that's a great question, Pony. Um, I love language. I, I feel, I, as you know, um, I was a really slow reader. I still am a really slow reader. And I realized I was reading and continue to read so slowly because I'm not only studying the story, I'm studying how it's on the page. I'm studying how words get put together. And when people are lazy, I get annoyed. <laughs> um, I also, I love, I read a lot of poetry. I was really scared of poetry as a young person. Um, I thought it was some hidden code that I was not meant to understand. And, and the more I studied it, like um, the more I started reading poets um, like Paul Lawrence Dunbar and um, Georgia, um, I'm blanking on George's last name, but anyway, Langston Hughes, Gwendolyn Brooks, and even um, Frost and people, and you know, present day people like Cornelius Eady and um, Ocean Vong, like really looking at people who pay a lot of attention to language helps me understand the importance of paying attention to language. And, and because um, I read it out loud, I really can hear how it's sounding on the page. And that's important to me. It's important for me for um, um, reading to be a very visceral experience, right? So when you go into that story, you are in that world and you, you are feeling all the feelings, you are, are part of um, the narrative, you, you know, you're, you're laughing when they laugh, you're crying when they cry, and that's all about the language. So that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, I definitely feel like yeah, and that couldn't be more, more true. And I think that's what makes your book so wonderful and so powerful <laughs> and, and hard at the same time because sometimes we do things because we're supposed to. And that was what was so wonderful is that seeing Iris develop in the way that she was true, that she was true to herself and she mm -hmm. was a good mother or a better mother because of the fact that mm -hmm. she listened to herself and who she was and find herself. So thank you for that. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you again. I'm so, so, I'm so honored. I love your work and I'm so excited to continue to read your work and read it with my children and my family. And that's so awesome. Have you as a rock star at home. I'm just so appreciative. Thank you.